Hello everyone, welcome to Bajirao IAS Academy, the Hindu News Analysis. Today is 26 June 2024 and in today's session we have some important and relevant news articles from different newspapers and we'll try to understand and analyze those important news articles in an exam perspective. Right? So before actually discussing all those important articles, let's try to solve uh, the yesterday given practice question yesterday I have given one practice question so the question was Pushpak so it was recently seen in news is related to which of the following right so option A suggests that a surface to surface anti-ballistic missile which is developed by DRDO no this is absolutely wrong and option B a winged vehicle of ISRO's reusable launch vehicle landing experiment yes this RLV landing experiment and it is a winged vehicle of the ISRO's reusable launch vehicle. So therefore this is the correct answer for Pushpak. Option B is the correct answer. Now if you look into the statements here, if you look into the explanation part of Pushpak, Pushpak is dubbed the Swadeshi Space Shuttle. Right. So Pushpak is a, a Swadeshi Space Shuttle and in fact it is India's futuristic reusable launch vehicle for launching and deploying satellites this pushpak will be used multiple times and that is where its name reusable launch vehicle and in fact it is a Swadeshi space shuttle and which is being used to deploy which is being used to launch the satellites into the space and in fact, the rocket's name comes from the Pushpak Viman of the Ramayan. In Ramayan, we very often come across this Pushpak Viman. And therefore, this reusable launch vehicle Pushpak name comes from this Pushpak Viman. And in fact, this Pushpak Viman is very well known as the vehicle of Kuber, Lord of Wealth. And in fact, it is designed as an all rocket fully re reusable single single stage to orbit vehicle and remember this it actually have one single stage to orbit vehicle and it is fully reusable launch vehicle and in fact it could do uh, it could even do refueling of in orbit satellites or it can even retrieve satellites from orbit for the refurbishment. So in some cases, the reusable launch vehicle is much more advanced, uh, advanced in nature and it would also prevent the threat of the satellite deb debris around the orbit of the Earth. And in fact, the pushpak is considered as a step towards India's aim to minimizing the space debris, right? So as I have already told you that this pushpak can refuel uh, in orbit satellites and along with that, it can also retrieve satellites from the orbit for the purposes of refurbishment. When it has the capability of retrieving satellites from the orbit around the earth, then it could easily minimize the space debris or space junk which has been increasingly becoming a problem around the orbit of the earth. And therefore, the pushpak actually sets the stage for establishing Bharate Antariksha Station by 2035. And in fact, we wanted to build an Indian space station, Indian International Space Station by 2035 in the low earth orbit of the earth. As of now, there is an international space station, right? We all knew about that. There is also or already an international space station. And this space station is collaboration of different countries in Europe. So all these countries have come together and managing this international space station, which is also known as ISS. But on the other hand, China has been building its own space station now. And India is also on its path to build an Indian international space station by the year 2035 
so therefore in its attempt to build such a stay such a space station this pushpak reusable launch vehicle will play instrumental role so today also i have another prelims practice question and in fact we have discussed about the critical minerals few days back and i have given a list of critical minerals and since there were such questions in upsc prelims in previous year questions i have given this question so the question is consider the following minerals so minerals are titanium tin vanadium silicon zir zirconium and cadmium so how many of the above minerals are listed as critical minerals by the government of india right so how many of these minerals are classified as or listed as critical minerals by the government of india so just look into the critical minerals and what are the minerals that the government has listed as critical minerals they are very important for the manufacturing and supply chain resilience in india and try to answer this question in the comment section and i will provide the correct answer in tomorrow's class now we'll start this discussion with a first very important article that stresses on the need to have the national security strategy now what is this national security strategy and why it is important for any country despite being india facing several threats and the global dynamics have been regularly changing and in fact most of the countries seeking india's active cooperation and active partnership in the indo-pacific region and chinese influence has been gradually or you know excessively increasing in this indo-pacific region and indian ocean region threatening india's sovereignty and security and therefore the author has been suggesting that this is the right time that india should have its own national security strategy so that it could deal with the emerging security risks and we will understand this in a very detailed manner right what is the context the context is that the author suggesting that india should have a comprehensive national security strategy so he stresses on india to have a comprehensive national security strategy now this national security strategy could address the diverse security challenges that india has been facing now we very often concerned about the two front war either you know china and pakistan attacking india at the same time and along with that so the world has been uh, uh, you know a uh, changing and the world has become becoming more and more dynamic and world has becoming a multipolar world where india's weight has also been significantly increasing and therefore in this context having a comprehensive national security strategy would certainly benefit india by effectively addressing the diverse security challenges that we have been facing as of now because remember india is a country which is bordered by or which is having two neighbors with which are nuclear armed neighbors so therefore india's national security decisions uh, if you look at the current india's national security decisions so they remain fragmented and mostly reactive in nature and in fact when we talk about this national security strategy there are number of countries who have this national security strategy for example us have their own national security strategy china and even pakistan also have some sort of a prototype of this national security strategy but it is very surprising that india don't have such a national security strategy however what are the issues which are surrounding the lack of a national security strategy there were number of issues in the lack of national security strategy now in fact as of now if you look into the india's national security decisions either defensive uh, offensive strategies or either you know uh, engaging or using force against anyone so everything comes under the national security strategy now how to protect the internal security and how to uh, you know maintain the external security how to maintain relations with the hostile nations such as pakistan and china and how to counter chinese growing influence in the region so all these things comes under the national security strategy and it also regularly takes stock of the existing 
existing defense capabilities further upgrading them further uh, making advancements in existing capabilities so therefore as of now india's national security decisions whatever decisions are being taken with respect to the national security matters they are very often fragmented in nature and they are also reactive in its uh, you know in their nature and in fact various military services have been competing for resources without a unified strategic vision so there is no unified strategic vision even among the different uh, wings of the armed forces there is no unified strategic vision but uh, it seems like each of these branches of uh, national security decision making have been working independently and another major shortcoming with respect to the uh, india's national security is a reactive policy making this is another major challenge because if you look into india's current approach of national security now how we protect our national security how to ensure national security so it is largely reactive in nature so since it is reactive in nature it is insufficient it is said that this particular national security decision making is insufficient to address the long term strategic risks okay so there were number of long term strategic risks and how do i address such a long term strategic risks so therefore uh, you know uh, issues like climate change pandemics and geopolitical tensions so they require long term vision long term vision and long term strategy and this long term vision and long term strategy can be long term security strategy can be framed through a comprehensive national security strategy and even in case of any strategic risks that we face in future we can easily overcome them because we will have a better preparedness through this comprehensive national security strategy and after that so when you look into the decision making with respect to the national uh, security so most of these decisions are often concentrated among the few individuals the decision making is mostly concentrated among some top brass officials and politicians right so that is the one of the concern and these decision making at the top level for ensuring national security very often criticized for lacking transparency and it also lacking broader input now when i say broader input so there were number of expert groups so the stakeholders expert group opinions advices are not taken into consideration right so whenever you wanted to have a long term vision and long term strategy to ensure national security it is a very important that you need to take into consideration different opinions different views and different strategies with respect to india's national security and thereby you need to form frame an optimum optimum policy so that is very very important in this context when we are planning for the national security strategy now what are the benefits of comprehensive national security imagine that if we have framed a comprehensive national security strategy now how it is going to benefit india so that is what we need to understand now whenever we frame such a national security strategy it actually helps us in holistic threat assessment now no doubt that every country faces threats right so no doubt that every country faces threats but even though countries have been facing threats the essence of the sustenance and survival of those countries rests on how a uh, you know uh, with how much uh, capability they have dealt with those threats so how they dealt with those threats and how they overcome the uh, you know uh, challenges which are being posed by such threats and when we have when we frame this comprehensive national security strategy so it will result in holistic threat assessment of various risks because the national security strategy would very often require the government to conduct a thorough assessment of the threats and opportunities right so uh, in our framework so it is called as swot analysis 
okay so a swot analysis can be possible with this national security strategy right so for a, a country like india the swot analysis of strengths opportunities weaknesses threats that we have been facing is very very important and here the broader input also plays a very very important role broad input plays a very very important role in swot analysis and essentially we should not concentrate the decision making at the top brass of the government either government officials or the politicians it is very very important that whenever we are taking the decisions the decisions must be decentralized to a some extent to accept the broader input into the decision making and therefore this comprehensive national security strategy will help in the careful assessment of the threats and opportunities and therefore it ensures long term risks for example china a nuclear armed state in future it can pose a major threats to india major threats to india's security so therefore ensuring wrong long term risks like china's naval expansion can be systematically addressed now if you look into the chinese aggressiveness and their assertive postures whether at the india china borders at the line of control or in the indian ocean we can see aggressiveness and assertiveness of china in recent times and in future china can be a major threat for india and when we have this comprehensive national security strategy this would certainly help us deal with the long term risks like china's naval expansion in a, a systematic planned manner and apart from that when we have this comprehensive national security strategy so it will also plays a very important role in uh, bringing in a strategic culture so in fact uh, indian foreign policy or indian security strategy are very often criticized for lacking the strategic culture right so it is very often criticized that india lacked strategic culture and strategic cult strategic thinking so when we have framed this comprehensive national security strategy so this particular strategy will certainly help in you know a strategic planning or bringing in the strategic planning in foreign policy and india's security policy and it will also result in optimum resource allocation for the national security and that is very very important because we need to understand the needs and the priorities of different agencies which ensures national security so therefore optimum allocation and utilization of resources very important and this national security strategy will play a very important role in bringing the strategic culture and optimum allocation of resources so therefore it actually provides a framework for long term strategic planning and long term strategic planning is very very important to deal with the number of threats and apart from that it would also prioritize the military and economic investments for example imagine that we have identified threats from china so when we have a comprehensive national security strategy document so we have identified that china will be a strategic threat for india but on the other hand in recent times there is a growing axis a growing friendship between china and russia okay so now we need to understand that russia is a major source of defense imports for india okay so it is a major source of defense imports for india there is no doubt about that so since we have disproportionately dependent on russia for our defense imports this national security strategy document outlines that we need to reduce our dependence on countries like china because its growing closeness with china and china in future may pose a significant security threats for india and that is where the comprehensive national security strategy may call for the indigenization of defense technology indigenization of defense procurement right so indigenization of manufacturing the defense 
equipment so all these factors this comprehensive national security strategy may emphasize keeping in mind the long term risks which can be posed by china so that is strategic planning and strategic thinking that is emphasized by the comprehensive national security strategy if it in place and apart from that this comprehensive national security strategy can also result in enhanced signaling and it would also gives a lot of credence to the diplomacy right now in last one decade india's diplomacy now if you look into the india's diplomacy so we can call india's diplomacy versatile and dynamic versatile and dynamic because india's image has been a significantly increasing at the global stage now india is also aspiring to become a unsc permanent member and in order to achieve such long term goals it is very important that we need to have this comprehensive national security strategy because those uh, security strategies would actually outline what are the ways and means which can make india a permanent member of the united nations security council and it also outlines the ways and means for india to maintain friendly ties with or you know how its relations with the superpowers like us france uk russia germany and japan so with all these countries so therefore we need to have a comprehensive national security strategy and it would clarify india's strategic intentions to both the allies that we have and at the same time the adversaries also so this will be the stance of india for allies and for adversaries so therefore overall it would strengthen its position as a net security provider now in the indian ocean region india is very often known as the net security provider because of its naval capabilities right so therefore it actually a network uh, you know net service net security provider in the indian ocean and it also improves the diplomatic relations with all other countries over a period of time so in this context we need to look into the implementation challenges and also the strategic coordination as well right so even if we have a comprehensive national security strategy so we need to look into the implementation and while implementing such a comprehensive national security strategy there are number of challenges now along with these challenges the strategic coordination is also the need of the har and therefore in this context the intergovernmental synchronization is very very important right so the intergovernmental synchronization with this comprehensive national security strategy is going to be a challenge because the national security strategy if it is framed it requires a greater coordination and a greater cooperation across different governmental agencies or various arms of the government for example between defense foreign affairs ministry and intelligence agencies so that synchronization is very very important for the successful implementation of this national security strategy right so overall it would ensure a unified efforts towards national security goals and in fact ensuring transparency and accountability is also another major challenge with respect to comprehensive national security strategy as we have already discussed if you look into the strategic planning in india as of now it is opaque in nature there is a lack of transparency and it is mostly concentrated among the top brass of government officials and the politicians and therefore publishing such a comprehensive national security strategy would introduce accountability mechanisms so there are certain accountability mechanisms on uh, the government officials on on the politicians and across different arms of the government right which coordinate and cooperate with each other and making it making the government strategic plan transparent to the public and ensuring that the bureaucrat are adhere to these political directives and apart from that the comprehensive national security uh, you know uh, national security strategy would provide a strategic blueprint because it provides a strategic blueprint 
and it would help guiding decisions on critical issues there are number of critical issues like development of military capabilities international part partnerships and also ensuring rational long term growth in india so all these issues can be addressed in a much more efficient manner if we have such a comprehensive national security strategy which is uh, you know which already uh, many of uh, the countries have so next important question is defense ministry signs 350th contract under idex miniature satellites now we will understand what is this idex and the miniaturized satellites and why the defense ministry has signed this recently the 350th contract under the innovations for defense excellence so this is innovations for defense excellence and it is a flagship initiative of the ministry of defense right so idex means innovation innovations for defense excellence right so innovations for defense excellence and this innovation for defense excellence idex is a flagship initiative of the ministry of defense and idex signed or ministry of defense on behalf of idex signed a space pixel technologies okay so assigned with the space pixel technologies for design and development of a, a miniaturized satellites and these miniaturized satellites are capable of carrying electro optical infrared synthetic operator radar okay and at the same time uh, hyperspectral payloads of up to 150 kg right so these uh, miniaturized satellites are capable of carrying these electro optical infrared synthetic operator radar aperture radar and uh, hyperspectral payloads of up to 150 kilograms and because of that reason the defense ministry signed uh, an uh, you know uh, a pact with the pixels and in fact this 350th idex contract enables innovation in space electronics innovation in space electronics is also a very very important right so this 350th idex contract will ensure innovation in space electronics where many payloads earlier deployed on dedicated large satellites are now being miniaturized now these payloads miniaturized in the sense that now these payloads are very very small in size right so they are small in size and they are much more efficient and uh, you know better in terms of working so miniature satellites uh, it is easy to send these miniature satellites into space because of their small weight and these modular small satellite will integrate multiple miniaturized payloads okay so these satellites will have a multiple payloads as per the requirement and when we have uh, you know these miniaturized payloads multiple payloads in a one single satellite it provide advantages like faster and economical deployment so ease of manufacturing manufacturing of such payloads or satellites is very very easy and it is also faster and it would lead to the uh, you know the uh, the cost is economical in nature and it results in ease in manufacturing scalability adaptability and it also result in less environmental impact as well right so apart from that the space pixel has been actively working to build and launch high resolution hyperspectral imaging satellites to provide detailed earth observation data over a period of time so this detailed earth observation data is also plays a very very important role uh, in various areas for example security and uh, you know minerals uh, deforestation sea level rises so everything this detailed earth observation satellites play a very very important role right so this idex scheme for startups okay so this is for defense excellence innovation for defense excellence so innovations for defense excellence it was launched in collaboration with startup india and atal innovation mission so you just have to remember this it it was started in collaboration with these two initiatives and startups to innovate new technologies and meet requirements 
of the defense forces and reduce our dependence on imports now we have been excessively dependent on imports right so for our major imports we have dependent on countries like uh, even us russia france israel now idex will promote innovation in defense manufacturing and it also promotes indigenization of defense technologies defense procurement defense manufacturing and therefore startups will innovate new technologies and it will also meet the requirement of defense forces over a period of time in india and it will reduce the dependence on imports and at the same time look for the opportunities to export the defense capabilities or defense equipment to the other parts of uh, the world and apart from that innovators can actually move ideas without an obligation to manufacturers under this idex mission so innovations for defense excellence idex initiative so idex is an initiative which is taken by the government to contribute towards modernization of defense industry right so the objective of idex is modernization of defense modernization of defense industry and at the same time the indigenization okay so indigenization of defense production and at the same time uh, reduce our dependence on imports reducing dependence on imports this is also a very important aim of it and at the same time enhance domestic procurement domestic procurement so all these are objectives of this innovation for defense uh, you know defense uh, excellence right so therefore this idex is an initiative which is being taken by the government to contribute towards modernization of defense industry and in fact it was launched by the government in the year 2018 the government has launched this in 2018 and idex aims to promote innovation and technology development in defense and aerospace by engaging with industries so those industries includes msmes startups individual innovators r and d institutes and academia so therefore there will be a multi stakeholder engagement right so multi stakeholder engagement multi stakeholder engagement with respect to idex is possible okay <coughs> excuse me. so innovation for defense excellence that is idex and the objective of idex is to achieve all these uh you know objectives so next uh, important article is k shaped economic recovery fuels the diverse inflation dynamics in india now first and foremost we will uh, understand what exactly is k shaped economic growth a k shaped recovery now after the covid 19 pandemic so we have experienced this k shaped recovery model now when i say k shaped recovery model so it actually means that uh, an uneven growth so not an equitable growth right not an inclusive growth rather it is an unequal or uneven growth pattern there were different sectors within the economy and different sectors would recover from the recession at different rates so some sectors it would be good and their recovery is faster and some sectors they recover slowly and some sectors which still faces this recession problem so that is k shaped recovery and whenever there is a k shaped recovery it still hurts economic growth and economic development so it in fact hurts both economic growth plus economic development also so how it hurts the economic growth and economic development because the uneven development of uneven growth of different sectors would actually impact demand in the economy now impacting demand in the economy would result in lower economic production right so lower economic production and shutdown of uh, you know existing industries 
and layoff of employees unemployment so all these are the consequences of this recession and k-shaped recovery from the recession so this recovery is causing divergent inflation trends with food and rural prices rising faster than other goods and services and urban inflation right so because of this a uh, k-shaped recovery what has been happening it has been causing a divergent inflation trends so there is no uniform inflation trend because of the k-shaped recovery so there is a divergent inflation trend for some goods the inflation is higher and for some goods the inflation is still lower so that is a divergent inflation trends and if you look into these divergent inflation trends because of the k-shaped recovery food and rural prices are actually rising faster okay so food and rural prices are rising faster compared to the goods and services and even the urban inflation right now what is the k-shaped recovery as i have already explained so you can see this image the k-shaped recovery in k-shaped recovery for example there are certain professionals who can see a growth right but on the other hand there were some sectors who still facing the problem of recession that is a k-shaped recovery so uneven growth is known as k-shaped recovery so it is an economic scenario in which different sectors industries groups within an economy now whenever whenever we talk about the economy it is a broader term right because uh, when we talk about uh, economy of any country it includes the primary sector secondary sector and also the tertiary sector broadly right so tertiary sector broadly right so primary sector essentially includes agriculture secondary sector include industry and tertiary sector include services right so therefore there are number of sectors and different industries and different groups within the economy right so all these different sectors different groups of people and different industries would start recovering from a recession at different rates and that is essentially known as k-shaped recovery so that is k-shaped recovery and with the k-shaped recovery what happens there is a divergent economic recovery patterns in the economy so there is no uniform economic recovery pattern there is actually a divergent economic recovery pattern for example earlier we have discussed that there is a divergent inflationary trends so with this divergent economic recovery pattern some parts of the economy experiences robust growth and others continuing to struggle or even decline so that are the consequences of k-shaped recovery and we all knew that during the covid 19 pandemic we have observed the economic recession we have observed the economic recession because there is a drastic fall in the productivity and lockdowns industries were shut down there was no demand no productivity layoffs poverty unemployment that over a period of time led to the economic recession across the world now what are the major features of this k-shaped economic recovery now when we look into the uh, features of k-shaped economic recovery as i have already told you that there are divergent recovery rates there uh, there are no uniform recovery rates there are divergent recovery rates divergent inflation rates and certain sectors certain technologies and finance may recover quickly and strongly while other sectors like hospitality real uh, retail sector may continue to struggle and recover much more slower and that is essentially k-shaped economic recovery and in fact this k-shaped economic recovery uh, very often leads to the income inequality as well right so it very often results in it very often results in income inequality as well now how it will lead to the income inequality because understand in k-shaped economic recovery there are certain sectors which are performing better but on the other hand there were a few sectors which still facing the issues of recession they were not able to register a decent amount of growth and in this context high income individuals and high income businesses may see significant improvements in their financial situations because of the different 
paces in the recovery of economy and different paces in the growth of different sectors industries and groups within the economy but on the other hand the low income individuals and small businesses still faces the prolonged financial hardships however there are some sectoral disparities also which are being caused by this k shaped economic recovery so of course uh, it is true right so this is actually uh, results the k shaped economic recovery results in sectoral disparities industries that can adopt adapt to remote work have online businesses models such as tech and e-commerce actually thrive over the industries which have the physical presence so that is the k shaped economy and its consequences however the government fiscal policies and prioritizing sectors which have been facing the worst effects of recession and ensuring availability of adequate capital in the economy all these factors will make sure that uh, we will be able to recover from this k shaped economic recovery or recover faster equitable or uh, you know uh, equal development of all sectors from the recession so next change 6 lunar probe now we'll understand what exactly is this Ch Ch change e6 lunar probe the context is that on june 25th change 6 became the world's first spacecraft to bring back samples from the far side of the moon and in fact india is also known to send one of its probe to the far side of the moon under its chandrayaan three mission right so in fact india was the first country to successfully land uh you know uh, a lander over the southern pole of moon or southern pole of moon or it is also known as the far side of the moon however recently change 6 change e6 became the world's first spacecraft to bring back samples from the far side of the moon so it successfully landed on the far side of the moon and it has also brought some samples of soil from the moon back to earth so this change e6 successfully returned with samples from the lunar far side so moon is also known as lunar and uh, lunar moon soil from the moon is also known as lunar soil so it collected samples and those samples were brought back to uh, earth successfully and in fact china is the first country to achieve this feat successfully sending a spacecraft a uh, bringing uh, you know lunar samples from the lunar surface to back to earth is the first uh, country that has successfully done this is china and in fact there were number of components which are in this change e6 the components include lander and this lander is equipped with drills and scoops for sample collection right so for example whenever uh, this is landed on the surface of the moon then it has to collect the samples from the lunar surface so therefore in order to collect the samples it is equipped with drills and scoops for such sample collection and it also has ascender once it successfully collected the samples from the lunar surface uh, in order to bring those samples back to earth so it need to ascend it need to escape from the gravitational pull of the moon so therefore it also has an ascender and this ascender transports samples from the lunar surface to the lunar orbit right so once it collected the samples from the lunar surface and this ascender transports it from the lunar surface to the lunar orbit and next there is orbiter and this orbiter will successfully bring the lunar samples from the orbit of the moon to the orbit of the earth and after that once it reaches the earth's orbiter from the earth orbiter Uh, there will be a returner and that returns sample successfully back into the surface of the earth and these are the major components that are in the change e6 now in fact this change e6 is a collaboration of different countries because it carries payloads from payloads of different countries and this change e6 mission carried instruments from different international partners they include french don 
that studied lunar dust and lunar volatiles italian inrri and it measured distances using retroflector and swedish nils it detected negative ions and uh, on the lunar surface so this is also an international collaboration pakistani i cube q cube sat so this imaged the lunar surface and obtained magnetic field data and in fact china sent one of its one of the pakistan's probe so that is orbiter into the moon so in fact it is the first uh, mission first lunar mission of pakistan so with the aid of china however what are the scientific goals of bringing uh, lunar samples back to earth so there will be a sample analysis and scientists aim to learn more about the moon's internal structure the composition and components of moon's soil surface and internal structure and differences between near and far sides of the moon and china's lunar exploration program and in fact this changi 6 follows previous missions under the china's lunar exploration program and therefore it is marking the next step in incremental technological advancements you now a series of tests uh, targeting or aiming at the moon are conducted and in fact change e6 is one of the such missions and all these missions are aimed at the exploration of lunar surface and in fact the lunar Uh, this change 6 mark the next step in incremental technological advancements because so uh, once they reached the surface uh, of the uh, you know moon and bringing back uh, you know a lunar sample successfully out of the uh, from the lunar surface uh, it actually requires a lot of technology so therefore they have also demonstrated the essential technologies in this regard now what is the significance of sample return missions right so it also has a significance because it allows the use of the sophisticated instruments to study chemical isotopic mineralogical structural and physical properties of the samples of lunar surface and in fact there will be long term preservation of these lunar soil samples and that can be preserved and reexamined by the future generations with much more advanced and sophisticated technologies and recovering samples from the far side is a significant technological achievement it also demonstrated their technologies uh, you know it actually uh, proves the potential of countries like china to send human beings into the Uh, you know lunar surface and bringing them back successfully uh, to the uh, planet earth so it is a step towards human exploration so change 6 is a seen as a step towards china's goal of landing astronauts and a land so china has been planning to land astronauts on the moon by 2030 so because of that reason this change 6 is considered as one of the most important mission for chinese however the so chinese may use lunar surface as a launch pad for the deep space missions in fact such a deep space missions it costs a lot of money to uh, launch you know uh, space missions into the different planets however moon could actually serve as a base for future deep space missions and extraterrestrial exploration and if we develop this technology further especially china now what is the outcome so there is a new lunar race that will uh, develop between different countries there is a global participation in exploring the lunar surface such as india chandrayaan 1 chandrayaan 2 chandrayaan 3 and china these change a uh, series of missions japan also recently sent one of its uh, probe mission into the uh, lunar surface us russia so all these are launched you know uh, to lunar missions by 2020 in 2023 right so when we talk about the future missions there will be over 100 moon missions by the governments and private companies by the year 2030 so it is expected that there will be 100 moon missions from governments and different private space agencies and long term goals unlike the 20th century space race that we have seen between us and ussr today's missions aim to establish long term presence and use of the lunar resources for interplanetary and deep space missions by these respective countries and that's all in this lecture and thank you so much so 
प्लीज़ लाइक द वीडियो एंड ऑल्सो सब्सक्राइब टू आर यूट्यूब चैनल थैंक यू